Hey, happy Monday. It's time for Tech Tip Q&A. And I'm going to wait for Christina to join me. Hey. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi, Liz. Hi, Josephine. We're glad you're here with us today. Um, happy Monday. So this is tech tip question and answer session. I'm Sarah Walworth. I'm a tech editor. I'm Christina McGrath, also a knitting tech editor. And today, Hi, everybody. hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're glad you're here with us. Um, once a month, we come live on Instagram to answer knitting designers and tech editors questions um, from a tech editor's perspective. So we spend our days editing knitting patterns and we like to help out other designers and tech editors with um, anything that they have questions about. So if you have a question for us, feel free to throw it into the comments and we'll do our best to answer it. We had a few questions come in ahead of time. And hi, Amy, it's good to have you here. Um, we're, uh, we have a few questions from last time that we didn't completely answer and we'd like to address those this morning. Um, so and we got a couple new questions too. And we got a couple new questions. Yeah. Um, so if you guys have any questions, throw them into the comments and we'll answer them at the end. Um, what, what should we start with, Christina? Should we start I think with... it'd be, let's finish up what we were talking about last week because those were last week's questions. So I think we should finish them. So the first thing that we want to discuss is ease, relative ease versus proportionate ease and what are the two and what are how are they related and which one should you use when you're designing and grading um and just as a little bit of a background i grade patterns for um knitwear designers where they send me a sample size and then i make it into all the other sizes for them so and i also teach a course on grading um, through the Tech Editor Hub, which you can find out more information about in my bio. And Christina just wrote a blog post about this issue in detail, discussing much more than we can even here. So if you need some more background on these topics, you can read her blog post. And then we also, my colleague, my grading colleague, Julie at work, um, also just posted a fantastic blog post about these this topic specifically so we suggest that you do a little bit of reading after you listen to our ig tv and see what you think and do let us know if you have any more questions after we discuss this either now in the comments or you can direct message us later on yep so we thought we would first define ease, number one. What is ease? Christina, do you want to take it or you want me to do it? You're doing great. Okay. Let's define, <laughs> let's define ease. What are we talking about? When, okay, so what is ease? Ease is how much space there is between the garment itself and the body. Right. Right. So there's space. If it's positive ease, like for instance, the sweater I'm wearing, I've got extra space here between the outside of my body and my chest level and the sweater itself. That's positive ease. And if it were snug and tight fitting, I might have negative ease or zero ease, which means there's no space between my body and the sweater or it's stretched to fit over 
and if it were laying flat, then it would would be smaller than the body. It would be smaller than the body. So that's what we mean when we're talking about ease. Now, when you are a designer and you are designing a particular garment to fit a, a range of body sizes, when you are changing from one body size to the next, you're looking at your sample garment and how it's fitting that sample size body and how much space there is. And you have to decide, how do I make it fit all these other body sizes in the same way? And currently there is a discussion, ongoing discussion in our community about how do you apply ease? Do you use the same amount of ease, which is what we call fixed Fixed ease, ease. for every body point across all the sizes? Or do you use proportional ease? And do you want me to go and do you want me to define proportional ease or do you want to take that one, Christine? Yeah, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Okay, here I go. (laughs) Let's see if I can do it. I'm totally on the spot. (laughs) Proportional ease is where you apply a percentage to that body point. And my dog just will not stop barking. I'm sorry about that. It's totally distracting me. So if I have a 40-inch bust and I am going to apply proportional ease to the other sizes, and I, my sample size is 11% of my 40-inch bust, or to say 10%. So I'm applying four inches of positive ease. When I get all the way up in the sizes to, say, 50 or 60-inch bust, then I would be applying that percentage and not in a, a specific amount of positive ease, but I would be multiplying it by a percentage which is five for the 50 five inches which is 10 percent and six inches for the 60 inch bust so the proportional ease means that this the amount of ease changes as you get bigger or smaller and then the big discussion is which is correct oh Okay, hold on a second. I got to get my dog to stop barking. You come here and lay down. Yes. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Lay down, puppy. Do you all want to see my dog? Here, I'll turn around. There she is. Rosie, lay down. Sorry, you guys are getting photobombed today. Okay, sorry about that. And maybe Christina's cat will walk across her desk. (laughs) She's sitting here like she's super irritated that I have a cup of tea on the desk. And she like, she wants it to be gone. She's super. She's so funny. She's here all the time. <laughs> okay. So now that we've defined, whew, that was tough. Now that we defined um, the, uh, hold on a second. I can't get rid of my keyboard here. So now that we've defined the terms, let's talk about now, how, what should you do? So Christina, you want to take it from here and then I can wrap it up. So the thing about, about not using proportionality, I, so I think, so grading is applying the same ease. When you're grading, you are taking your sample size, like Sarah said, and applying that same ease that got you the fit you wanted yeah. for your sample. And you apply the same ease on all the parts of the body for all the sizes. And the reason that you do that is so that the fit will be the same. Proportionate ease may work for like other things in life, but it doesn't work for fitting bodies because the size of the body doesn't have anything to do with the way the garment will fit or the, the ease that you apply, right? You can be any size body and for the sweater to fit the same and look the same, the same amount of ease needs to be applied to all the sizes. So I think that is, um, I think people have misconceptions about that. I think people don't get that that's what has to happen. You know what I mean? Um, and that's just basically what it is. If you like, if you like the sweater, she was wearing the sweater I'm wearing. If I change the amount of ease on my body to another body, it's not going to look the same because it doesn't matter how big the body is. What matters is the space between the garment and the body. 
-hmm. And that's what needs to be the same for the fit to be the same. And when you are designing a garment and you write a pattern and there's pictures and everything, you are promising the knitter that this is how the fit is and this is what it looks like. So if the knitter picks a size and gets gauge, she should get, he, she, he or she or they should get what you promised mm -hmm. in the design. And when you change the ease in other sizes based on that picture sample size and you change the ease to be something different, it's not going to fit the same. It's not going to look like the picture and your pattern's going to be a liar. Um, Julie makes a good way to describe this, I think, in her post where she says, if you, like Sarah just gave the example of having 10% of ease and using proportionate ease in, across the sizes, it changes the fit. If you have four inches of ease, that's kind of like a standard fit. If you have five inches of ease, six right. inches of ease, you've now morphed that garment from a standard fitting garment in this picture to an oversized garment. Exactly. And I think that these misconceptions are made because um, every knitter has a different preference, right, for how they want things to fit. But you definitely need to have a starting point for them so they can choose what size they want to make based on how they want it to fit them. But they have to know that the design integrity is going to remain and that the design promise is the design they're going to get if they follow the instructions. Josephine had a comment. I yeah. just had a tech edit where the designer used proportional ease for determining the neck circumference of a sweater that did not work out at all. The necklines for the larger sizes were huge. Thanks, Josephine. That's another really good point. That's excellent. When you're designing body, designing bodies, when you're designing Design. garments for body, for body, <laughs> everything you do affects another part. If you make the neckline, like Josephine said, proportionately larger for all the larger sizes and proportionally smaller and, but the neckline is not something that grows considerably differently in each direction the way a bust does, say, right? So where bust and bicep might be exponentially different from a smaller size to a larger size, the neckline might not be very different, only slightly. It changes gradually, not in the same way. If you change this that much and it all, you know, proportionately is different, you're gonna, it's going to fall off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And everything you do in a garment affects everything else that's going on in the garment. Right. Um, and this is why proportionate ease may be a concept that works in the world for other things, but it's not something that's going to work for fitting bodies because you're not talking about the size of the body. You're talking about that space between the garment and the body. And that has right. to be the same across sizes for it to look and fit the same way. So since we know this, you know, the reason I think people get off track is because of designer pre knitter preferences, but also designers' misconceptions about how things ought to fit people and what types of bodies should wear certain types of garments. Mm -hmm. And um, I really think that's at play. And I'm, I, I really do because I know I'm cheap. Please. I know <laughs> it's almost as bad as me wrangling my dog with my right arm right now. <laughs> Because both things will happen, right? You'll see both things right. happening. You'll right. see that there will be sweaters, um, and up in the larger sizes, you know, there's there, there there's huge wrists and huge necks, and the arm lengths are like down here because people think that they don't they don't think about fit in the same way for the larger sizes. They just, right. just like just making it big enough, make sure there's room, make sure there's space, and that. Um, and that, you know, fat people shouldn't wear tight fitting clothes, right? Like that's just like a, an opinion some people have, but the opposite is also, also happens in our community where people really want to be size inclusive and they'll say that they have a size inclusive garment and you'll look at the schematic and see that there's meant to be four inches of positive ease in the garment, but it goes up to a 60 inch bust, but the 60 inch bust that they're claiming is a size 60 has no ease. Right. Exactly. So it's really only a 56 inch bust that it goes up to because you have to account for that four inches of ease and they don't always count that. Right. Um, because they want to, you know, it's like everybody has their different end they want to get to, you know? Um, 
But I think so there then, are, and I think they're also, it's not just about maybe designers' opinions about how clothes should fit fat people, but also yeah. people not having enough knowledge about fat bodies or enough knowledge about different sized bodies. And mm -hmm. that's where your size charts are really going to be helpful to you. Yes. And you have to pay attention to them. You can't just say, oh, well, I want to make sure, I want to make sure, or, you know, I, I don't want to sacrifice the color work in my yoke, so I need to make all these rows. And then this woman has, like, a gaping hole, giant arm depth, arm hole depth sweater when mm -hmm. it doesn't look like that in the picture, you know. Well, that was one of our questions was about, um, about one of the proportional ease questions we got was about the cuff and about how to mm -hmm. not alter the design elements while so, getting the cuff to the right size. Let's go there then. Let me read that question because I think we answered the other one um, already with just our definitions. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. I think, so, we did, I think the definitions was really a good idea. Um, so something that we've said in the past was that the wrist measurement on most bodies doesn't really get ginormous. So it doesn't increase at the same rate that a bust increases or the upper arm increases. For the most part, wrists, even up until you, I've, the smallest wrist size that I've measured is about five and a half inches. No, five and a half, just about six, maybe just five and point seven five inches. And then the largest is at most 8.25 inches. So there is not a huge difference in wrist measurements across the range of, of possible body sizes. And so we got a question. I understand your point that wrist circumference does not change hugely for the larger sizes. However, what I have found that is if I make the cuff circumference with a fixed ease in terms the the wrist, the cuff measurement to the wrist fixed in terms of ease, testers in the larger sizes report that the cuff doesn't look right in proportion to the sleeves and the overall garment. This is particularly the case when cables or other decorative elements are involved in the cuff design. So should I base the cuff circumference in proportion to the sleeve at its fullest point up here? instead of the wrist, even if technically that means that the cuff has more ease in the larger sizes, what do you think? So this is where I really had to sit and think for a while, what is the best way to answer this question? Um, and what I came up with is you have to decide what your intention is as a designer and what you're being true to and what is your job? What are you doing? So is your job to make every single size's sweater, if they were laid flat out on the ground, look exactly the same, just bigger? So in other words, like you took a picture of something and then you pulled the corner and just morphed it bigger? If that's your goal is to maintain the integrity of the design shape when laid flat, that's not designing or grading. That's a misapplication of the grading principles. Grading is not morphing something where you're just making it bigger because the bus size gets bigger. Bodies change at different rates. So in other words, our shoulder widths generally don't get much bigger. The very propor you know, proportionally, they get very bigger very, not slowly. very much. Slowly, yes. And compared to the bus size, because a larger um, person may have more breast tissue and that's why their bust size is larger, but their wrist still may only be seven inches big. Right. So you have to decide as a designer, and this is where we're kind of pushing a little bit as this is our opinion. And, but we also want you to think about what is your intention for designing? Because if it's just to morph and make things bigger, that's not going to fit bodies. And so you have to think instead about that relationship of the space of the garment to the body. And while it may not look the same, the design itself, if you laid it out flat on the floor, it's gonna, the sleeve itself is gonna be a completely different shape in the larger sizes than in the smaller. When it is on a body that fits the same. 
Right. And that's I, where fixed ease comes in. And that's why it's so important to apply the same ease and to solve the problems related to stitch patterning and cables. Well, and remember that, yes, it's important to maintain the, I think her example was a cable motif on right. a cuff. And of course, right. it's important to maintain that. And of course, you want it to look good. But there is a way to resolve that multiple to fit into a stitch count that you need right. to get you the cuff size that you need to fit the body. Because please, let's remember that while, yes, the lace and the cables and the, all the decorative things and all the stitch patterns we use, everything is, a, is your creative design. And absolutely, that is very important. And that's what we're doing, right? Right. But grading is also creative work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I love fitting it. bodies well is important work. And if you're making a sweater inside. that looks this particular certain design element way, but doesn't fit, did you meet your goal? Yes, like, exactly. Did you get there? What's or your goal? A little more, right. So is there a little more you could do to get those design elements to work in all the sizes that you want to offer? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and I do think it's important if you're to offer as many sizes as you can because bodies come in all shapes and sizes. And it does pose a challenge, but there's so many resources out there for us to get this right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and because and, um, grading is also creative work. And there's so, a way to get that multiple to work. There to is a the way. Wrist. And if you have a hard time, that's why you need to. Hi, Creative Me DK. Merry Christmas to you, too. Um, the, there is a way to solve these problems. And you may have to think outside the box, in, box and you may need to get some help. And it's okay. That's why there's designer forums. That's why we have multiple tech editors who are willing to offer their time and their expertise to help you. Um, <coughs> the other thing I wanted to touch on here, um, Christine, I hope this is okay. I'm kind of going beyond that question. Hey, how's it going? Um, is be careful what you receive from your testers. So the question was, well, my testers think this, right. and therefore I'm going to change the design completely. I would say testing is should the purpose of testing is to make sure that your pattern is accurate, correct, clear, concise, all the things that we've talked about before in our previous tech tip talks. And it's also to test fit. That is true. But testers may have certain opinions about how things fit on their body. And it may not line up with your design goal for that design. Yeah, and so when you get comments like that from your testers, yes. it's a good idea to ask more questions. I don't exactly. want, I'm not calling any testers liars at all. But what I'm saying right. is there's many other things that could be at play. So instead of saying, um, if, depending on what, you're, what, what answers you're wanting to get, but what gauge did they get? How much ease did they have in the wrist? Um, what ha what, why didn't the cable pattern work in the cuff? You know, there's questions you can ask to figure out what's really going on um, before you go and change your entire design. And That's you have to design. decide if the tester's problem with that aspect of the cuff, let's say, is a personal issue, like a personal fit issue. They just don't like, a, they like it to be really loose here. Right. Or if it is an actual error in your pattern. Right. If it it's is a, a really error. That's a really important difference. Yes. Right. That's a really important difference. Ruth has a comment. She said that such good advice, learning to sift through tester feedback has been such a big leap for me design wise. Yes. There's just, you've got to ask questions. Exactly. Before you accept something like that. I, I mean, before you take it as the end of the road, like ask questions, find out all the details you can about what arrived them to this comment, arrived them, how they arrived to this comment, you know, ask the questions. And maybe make it clear in your testing information that modifications are allowed or not allowed because every, every knitter makes modifications for the most part, when you're dealing with garments, a lot of people don't knit the patterns as is. So you'll have to make that call in your testing group. Um, well, and you have to, you have to also know what modifications they made. Josephine says maybe the size the tester chose to make was not the most appropriate. 
And exactly, that. because the knitter's going to choose the size that they want for the kind of fit that they want. So it's important to know what they were even going for, what modifications did they make, what size did they make, and how it right. fits their body. Wow, it, good point. Sorting through testers' comments is so important, and I've never heard it discussed before. Just <sighs> ask those questions. Yes, communicate. You know, before they say, when they say, oh, this doesn't work, this didn't work, I, this is way too big, this is way too small. Well, what gauge are you working at? What size did you make? How much ease do you have in that place? Like, ask all the questions to find out the truth of what's really going on. Yes. Before you change your pattern. Be very cautious about making global changes to your pattern based on one tester's feedback. So if there actually is an, there is an error pointed out, then that's one thing. It's another thing to do something according to someone's pet peeve or preference. So just find uh, out. Ask find out. Questions so you can find out the truth of what really is going on in your pattern and what needs to actually be changed because it might not even be what you think. The other thing that you can do to make a pattern, and we've talked about this before too, more of a success is give a detailed schematic so that your testers and your knitters can see exactly what measurements happen where on what part of the body and how they change across the sizes. And that also gives them the information they need if they decide, hey, I don't want to use that design ease. I don't want a standard fitting two to four inches of ease from my bus size, I want it tighter, then they can choose to knit a smaller size. If you don't give them schematic information, then they're going to have a more difficult time of choosing a size, and they're not going to know what they're supposed to get at the end. Um, so schematics are awesome to please include always, in your pattern. But please, in, honestly, I'm a big proponent for including the schematic in the place where the pattern can be bought, like on your website, on Payhip, on Ravelry, wherever you're selling yes. your patterns, have a schematic available in some way, in a picture, in a PDF that they can get separately or just on the sales page right. so that they have the information they need to decide if they can even make the sweater for themselves or for whomever they intend it for. Right. Because there's nothing worse than buying a pattern, getting it, reading the schematic and realizing that it's not going to fit. <laughs> for who you want it for and now you have this pattern you can't use so right. give them the information they need see if so they can decide if it's really the sweater they want to make you know hey excuse me i gotta let her out you guys hold on yeah, okay <laughs> animals this morning everything's everywhere okay so we have a really quick question that i can answer i think liz let me answer this question really quick while we're while we're taking a tiny break um, Liz asks, I'm in the process of making up a style sheet. Do you know of a good resource for this? Oh, you know, Liz, I had hoped. One I have a blog post about that. <laughs> Christina has an awesome blog post on this. And if you personally called all about style sheets and also, um, oh, yep. sorry, go ahead. You were going to say, no, no, no. I was going to say, go read Christina's blog post. And if that doesn't give you all the information that you need, message me and I can send you a form that you can fill out with your information so that you can uh, make decisions on that. Okay, I need to look at the time. I forgot to bring a watch out here. Look at that, we have style sheet resources. <laughs> okay, so Liz, message me if you don't get the information that you need on Christina's blog or um, on anything else. Uh, so let me scroll through the comments here. I think that was the only question we didn't answer. I was saving that till later. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I jumped in while you were putting the cat out. Uh, no, no, no. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So uh, design by so-and-so asks, any recommendation for making schematics? Yes. Um, I believe that my mentor, my tech editing mentor, Jolie, creates on the tech editor hub, still has a schematics that you can There's purchase a schematics course for using in inkscape inkscape and it's not even expensive it's no. like a little mini course to learn how to use inkscape to make schematics and i highly recommend it that's what i use in my business so inkscape is a uh cloud uh sorry i think it's an open source software that's similar to adobe indesign and you can create vector images and SVG files and draw any kind of digital image. It takes, there's a little bit of learning curve with it, but Jolie has created um, pre-made schematics that you can just 
alter a little bit to get you started. And that has been super, super useful to me when I was first learning how to do schematics digitally. The other thing that you can do is you can just hand draw them, take a picture of it, upload it to your computer and use that. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Well, Some... and, and of course, in Adobe, you can do all of that too. Right. But, um... Liz says we're incredible. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. We love that you're here to, <laughs> and listening in on our, on our yammering and opinion, opinion laden, uh, I know discussions. <laughs> um, so do you think we covered proportional and relative ease enough? Or I hope so. Ease. I hope so. And like I said, Julie has a blog post she recently wrote talking about the differences, and so do I. Yes. Um, and definitely those are worth a listen. And we obviously like talking about it. So I'll listen, a look. Um, so, <laughs> Ruth, thanks. You guys are funny. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoy having you here, Ruth. Um, you guys are funny. If you... um, but I, I just, I mean, just keep in mind what your goal is. If yes. you, if, if good fit, and good fit, I think, should be our goal. Good fit for fit. all bodies. That's what we're trying to do yes. here. What is the way to get that? And the yes. way to get that is to apply fixed D's to all the points on the body across the size range. One, That's how one, you're going yeah. to maintain good fit for and your design. One thing we didn't cover that I think is super important, we'll just do this on, the, on taking this, this topic out. If you do apply the same ease at every body point, all the way up and down the sizes off of your body size chart. So in other words, if your neck width has four inches of positive ease and you apply that across the sizes, then your knitter can make the decision easily about what size they're going to knit. If That's your right. ease it's changes across the sizes, then it's going to be confusing to them and they will not be able to make good choices and you may end up with more customer service issues. It, that's very important because we all make modifications, mm -hmm. but we need good information to start with, to be able to base those modifications on. That's important. So even yes. if they are going to change the fit or even if they might want more ease than you recommend or less, you've got to give them a place to start and yep. do try to let go of those misconceptions that we have. I've, I mean, I don't know. I've been doing this, I can't remember four or five years. So that's not even that long. And you wouldn't believe the kinds of excuses I have been told about why they think that their designs wouldn't work for fat bodies or why I can't design that. Or, you know, I mean, come on, that's not your decision. Let's try to remember that, you know? And we really have to consider the source of our thinking. If you're, the source of your thinking is, is that you're deciding for a knitter what looks good on their body, that's off base. And it's not your business. It's not your business. Let the knitter decide what they want to wear. That's just the facts. And if they want to wear your sweater, they want mm -hmm. the sweater in the picture. <laughs> yes. Right? Right? Exactly. They don't want a different one. Right. Or they wouldn't buy that pattern. So they, they don't want something. I mean, that's the whole point, really, right? So like Sarah said, just, you know, what's your goal? What's your goal? You know, what's if your goal? goal is to have the same fit across all the bodies, then you just got to apply fixed ease. The that only kind of leads us into, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, that only leads, okay, so when do you use proportionate ease? Because I have used it in some cases. In the case when you would use it, where I use it as a starting point. So for instance, I don't have a good body measurement for a particular point that I'm trying to grade. Then I would start with proportionate ease, but then I watch because I'm like, okay, this doesn't, this isn't going to fit the body in the same way. And that's and where the relationships between the points on the right. body when you're designing a garment are going to be really important and helpful when you're doing your designing. And if some people use it when they're designing something that has to be really loose and drapey, but even then I, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know what, if you're applying 10 inches of ease, or even some of these designs have 20 inches of ease, then that's what, it's not going to fit in the same way if you apply a different amount of ease, even if it's supposed to be drapey and loose. So I, I still don't think proportionate ease is ever a good application in the context of grading between sizes. All right. Just that kind of leads us to our, oh, sorry. 
Oh, Josephine said, search Jolie's schematic on YouTube for a mini tutorial on schematics. Yeah, I think she oh, has sweet. all the information up there. Thank you, J Josephine. Um, go ahead. That, the, the question that we got about what is oh. the designer getting back from a yes. tech editor who does their grading, that right. kind of leads us into that. Okay, so that, next... Let's read that question. Let's read that. And remember, if you guys have questions, throw them into the comments, and we'll do our best to answer. That's why we're here. Um, so the question we got was, when grading a pattern, what should the editor send to the designer? And Josephine, if you're still here, I'd like you to jump in on this one. She's a grader, too. When grading a pattern, what should the editor send to the designer? Like, should they send the Excel sheet or a pattern draft, but only adding the numbers to the existing size? Or should they send a full-on, ready-to-knit pattern? Okay, this is a matter of deciding what is your business service providing. So you should make it clear up front between in your communications on your information page on your website, um, on all your information material about your service provide, what you provide as a service, what it is that you do when you grade. So me as a grader, when a designer sends me a, the information for grading, I don't send back an Excel sheet for the most part. I only do that with one client and it's just because I think she's trying to learn how to do it. Um, I don't send an Excel sheet and I send the pattern ready to knit. Um, I write, I ghost write the other sizes. That's the service that I provide. And that's very clear in all my information. Now my colleague, um, I have another colleague who does grading and she just sends the Excel sheet. She doesn't write the pattern. She's not a pattern writer, but she's happy to do the math for you as a designer. And then you take the numbers and you write the pattern. So both of these ways are completely legitimate ways of providing the same service or providing different aspects of the same service, um, different levels. So you have to decide in your business, what is it that I want to do? Do I really like pattern writing? Do I want to have more control over how the pattern ends up so I don't get a lot of um, questions about it later? Or do I just want to do the math for them and I'm willing to work with people who can take the math and then write the pattern? So that and has as a designer, what do you need? Exactly. Find someone who's going to be able to give you what you need because this really is a case of what services are offered and what you require and, and finding would, that good fit. And I would say if you're just trying to build your business right now, you may want to play around with the first few jobs. Okay, mm -hmm. what do I want to do? What, what fits me? What do I love? And then go from there to make a determination. Okay, I definitely do not want to just provide, skip, uh, you know, Excel sheets. I really would like to write the pattern. Okay, so then move your business in that direction. So I think that's the easiest way to answer that question. Do you think that's good, Christina? Yeah, I think it depends on what what's being offered and what is required. Right. Um, and also, I mean, for me, um, I would think about just if I were – like if I were designing, I wouldn't know what I would want because I don't. But if I were editing and I was grading a pattern and I was giving it to a designer or completed, this is your graded pattern. I would think about what is the best way for me to give it to them that will be least likely to be misconstrued or will be least likely to in, in, like invite error when they go through it to apply it to their pattern. What is the way that's going to make it error free as much as I can give it to them, you know? Josephine says, I send the pattern back with all the grading information inserted, ready to knit for all the sizes. I do send the spreadsheet to the designer, but I suspect that is not used. I don't use spreadsheets people send me. I don't either. I have a really hard time looking at other people's spreadsheets. Sometimes it's, like, it's helpful to read to them and look at them. Like, it can be helpful to me. I'm not saying I don't want them. They're helpful, but I don't, I still have to do my own, you know? Yes. I have a hard time. It's kind of the way that so we all build like spreadsheets is different. does what you do, too. I yeah. also provide finished measurements for a schematic and the yarn requirements for each graded size. Yes. And I do the same thing. And I suspect that most people who just send a spreadsheet do the same. Um, they just don't In the put, spreadsheet. Right. They do it in the spreadsheet. So, right. and the other half of the question, which I, I won't go into too, too much deep, that if the designer didn't write any of the sizes, they just made a stitch pattern chart, like with cables and stuff. Should the editor write the pattern in that case? <sighs> 
I still think this is a matter of you deciding what service you want to provide because mm -hmm. you can tell the designer in a spreadsheet, Hey, you got to work. The cable repeats this many times for each size. So that information can still be provided just in a spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be written into a pattern. So you got to make your agreement in your understanding with your clients very clear. And this is just part of what we've talked about before with the designer tech editor relationship. You have this great just to communicate what you provide and what the designer is agreeing to when they hire you. Mm -hmm. All right. Should we move on to the question that you got? Is that the last one? Isn't yeah, it? it's the last one. Yeah, so, good. Yep. Hey, uh, all right, everybody pop questions into the comments. If you have any, cause we're on our last question. We're on our last question. <laughs> Hi there. I have a question for your tech tip talk. I'm not sure if it's been answered before, but I was wondering what a designer should do if they are typically a tight, knitter or a loose knitter that's me in regard in regards to the gauge you would provide for a pattern um for example i know my stitches are usually short so i feel like if i design a pattern with a non-standard gauge it would be putting the knitters at a disadvantage would i need to compensate in my measurements thanks in advance and looking forward to your talk do you have any thoughts on this before i answer it um I, I, uh, I think gauge. that it's really important that you don't change your gauge from the sample that you're creating, that you are basing your entire pattern on. I yes. think keeping the gauge the same is important. You might change the recommended needle size if you find that the needle size you use is way off what you know to be the norm. I know some people do do that, but no, I don't think you should change the gauge if the sample, if the design is based on this, that gauge, Sarah. I think part of this, part of your question is, I, I'd like to address a little bit of what's happening in the background here is that uh, yeah, that's, you're not more... standard. Right. You don't fit into the box and therefore why would I design? Because then it wouldn't fit into the box. I'm going to push back on that. What you are knitting and creating is you, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So let's say that you generally knit looser or you generally knit tighter. That's okay. You're creating something out of your own hands, and the key is, is to take what you create and translate it into words that another knitter can reproduce. Now, we talked about this in our gauge conversation, I think. I think we discussed yeah. this. The information that you give to the knitter in the gauge information is really key. Mm -hmm. So it does, like Christina said, it should absolutely match what your sample produces. So if you are a loose knitter and you knit a sweater um, and the gauge is 20 stitches over four inches by 24 rows over four inches. That information is what the knitter needs. Now, how you de you don't have to give a needle size. There's no requirement to give needle size. Needle sizes can be suggested. You right. can and they are suggested. You might notice that sometimes on patterns. Yes. Lots of times it says suggested needles. It's not like right. You have to use these needles. You need to mm -mm. get gauge. That's what mm -mm. you need to do. <laughs> if you are able to get a certain gauge and you love it, and this is, gauge is part of your design. This is a super important point that a lot of designers, I think, miss. You're creating fabric, and you're creating it to have a certain feel and a certain texture and a certain hand, which is a drape. And your, your knitters need to be able to reproduce that. So what you do is you give them the gauge information that matches your sample so that they can reproduce it. And your pattern needs to be written according to that gauge. Now, needle size is neither here nor there because we are all different. Our hands are different. The way we tension the yarn is different. The needles that I use is not the same needles that Christina might use to get the same gauge. Everybody sits down with the same needles and same yarn and they're all gonna get different size swatches. <laughs> right. So give the knitter what they need and be confident in who you are as a knitter. It doesn't matter. Don't compare. Comparison is an ugly trap. Don't fall into that. Seriously. And don't, do not think that because you are a loose knitter or a tight knitter that you are substandard. It is who you are as a knitter and it's beautiful. And you, you're creating something gorgeous. 
So I would say, make sure that that's not happening in the background. If it isn't awesome. Right. And don't worry about um, including needle size. You can include the one that you used and just say, you choose a needle size that gives you the gauge that you can get or you know use the terminology like or size that it obtained for you to obtain gauge um, and make sure that you say suggested you could also use the needle size that's on the yarn ball if there mm -hmm. is one you could use that one if you wanted right. to uh, everybody uses a different needle size that's part of knitting it's part of learning how to be a good knitter to achieve the designer's gauge so don't compensate your measurements don't change your gauge Use the gauge that you got to get the sample to create the pattern and to create the schematic because that's what's going to give the knitters the most success. You can also The gauge is the control. Aha. The gauge it. is the control. Nothing is going to work for the right. knitter if the design right. is based on a different gauge that is not the gauge on the pattern. Right. They're exactly. not going to get it. They're not going to get it. And they want to get it, right? They don't care if your stitches are short. They don't. they don't care about that. They <laughs> saw the thing and they want it. You got to use the gauge that you designed with. Now, you know, you, you've got to use the gauge of your sample. If you used a yarn that's no longer being produced, which is something I think I would probably end up doing. <laughs> that happens. It's so it hard happens. when that happens. Or you use, you know, like say a super expensive hand dyed yarn that someone gifted you and maybe your knitters need something that's a little bit more affordable. Um, then give information about what your stitches should look like, right? So in other words, so that they can substitute yarn. You can also use yarnsub.com to kind of get, help your knitters to choose a different yarn. Um, so there's a lot that you can do in the introduction part of your pattern to give your knitters some more success. Describe the fabric. I know designers that even like do like little real videos of what the fabric looks like to give their, their knitters a better idea. Um, so give you, give your knitters what they need for success and don't discount your own skills and your own creative power. That's all. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> I don't think we get any more questions. We answered the, um, the other hey, one we got. Um, I was not able to. Sorry. Everything's getting loud. <laughs> yeah. My son is like, he must be on a break. <laughs> like screaming. He's such a happy, joyful kid. Oh, he's oh, he's such a noisemaker. He is always like, blah, blah, blah. It's so funny. It's, it's Dude, beautiful noise. Oh, my God. <laughs> my, my, my yard, I thought I could go outside and have quiet, but okay, knit and not. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Yay, thank you for Adrian. joining I'm us. I'm glad we helped. I'm glad we helped. Um, do a you recommend allowing test knitters to make modifications to your pattern or not? Well, that's up to you. That's that is totally, totally up, to, up you. to you. Just know that if they because I mean I mean there's you might want them not to so that you can really know what your pattern is doing but you also might want them to make modifications so that you know how modifications are going to play on your design right and to make sure that every knitter can get what they want because knitters are going to make modifications they so that are. might be good testing also right. but it's um it's up to you just make sure you know if they did just make sure you know if you did if they did you know what I mean yes. make sure you know Make that one of your follow-up questions is, yeah. did you make modifications to the pattern? And, and what are they? And what are they? <laughs> and, you know, you can leave room in your pattern. So, for instance, if you're designing a top-down circular yoke, you could say knit to preferred length or this many row rounds or this to this length or your desired length. And maybe the modification would be that they prefer a shorter sleeve or a longer body. And that whatever. may be... Right. So that may be standard questions in your testing anyway, because lots of designs include modification options. Right. right. So well, that's stuff you'd need to know. Do you guys have any more questions? You better throw them in there because we're all, we're about ready to wrap this up. Um, thank you, Liz, for all your questions. And we hope this, so this will be our last uh, tech tip Q and A till the end of, uh, till next year. We'll come back the third week third Monday in January, we'll be back to answer more of your questions. Um, do you have any, uh, anything That's else? That's the 18th. Oh, you know what? What? Is that not going to work? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to, you guys, the next time you see me, I'm going to look different. I'm not going to be able to do the 18th because okay. I have an orthodontist appointment. 
So, oh, okay. So then we'll we'll keep you guys. We'll informed. do it the twenty fifth. It'll be the fourth or third. We'll figure it out. It's, we'll figure it out. It's just, just not going to be stay the tuned. It won't be the eighteenth, but we'll figure out when. We'll be back here again. You're very welcome. Uh, we love so to welcome. have you guys here, um, and we love your questions because. We, we just really like nerding out and talking about all this stuff <laughs> instead of staring at our computers all day. If it um, can be helpful, you know? Yes, we want to help. So, uh, you bet. Yeah, thank you so much for giving us all this great info. You are very welcome. Um, and we hope that you guys have a very happy and joyful and peaceful end to 2020. We're ready to see this year done. And we'll see you again in the new year, probably mid to end January. Keep an eye on our Instagram feeds. We'll post a few days before so that you can shoot us some questions. And we're always here and available. If you have any questions, you can ask us ahead of time. So happy new year and happy holidays in happy every way holidays. that you celebrate. That's right. Take, take care of yourself. And we'll see you guys in January. See you in 2021. Bye. Bye.